The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? I will never forget being an eyewitness to the financial crisis of 2008. It was late summer, and I was director of the United States Mint. We were sitting in the Treasury Secretary's conference room in the historic Treasury building next to the White House. Around a large oval table were 20 heads of Treasury business units, like the IRS commissioner and myself. There were 20 more senior staff sitting around the perimeter of the room. The Washington heat and humidity were as stifling outside as the issues being discussed inside. Several subprime lenders had already gone bankrupt. Bank of America was forced to buy Countrywide Financial. J.P. Morgan Chase acquired Bear Stearns. The Fed shut down IndyMac Bank. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were teetering on the edge of collapse. And there we were in the Secretary's senior staff meeting. In the middle of the table was my boss, Secretary Hank Paulson, who was a former chairman of Goldman Sachs. Hank nodded, and we went around the table giving our reports. I shared two items. First, the demand for circulating coins was dropping like a rock, and that indicated that retail sales were starting to nosedive in our country. Second, the demand for gold and silver bullion coins was skyrocketing. And that meant that investors were selling off traditional investments and buying safe haven assets. These disturbing trends were forecasting a very bad third quarter for the United States of America. Things were going quickly from bad to worse. I looked up after giving my report and I saw the concerned looks on my colleagues' faces. And then it hit me. I literally and figuratively had a seat at the table during the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And that seat simultaneously held the director of the United States Mint and a follower of Jesus Christ. I had decided to follow Jesus as a senior year in college and I believe that Christians should live out their faith in all parts of their lives, including what they did in the workplace. And now there I was, a Christian in public service at the center of a global crisis. Can a Christian in public service make a difference? It's a worthwhile question to ponder. So why is the answer not a simple, automatic yes? Well, one reason is that government employees work in a workplace that's becoming more secular each day. Another reason is that Christians in public service are often suspect of discriminating against the LBGT community, of disdaining science and rational thought, of treating women as second-class citizens, of bigotry, racism, and censorship, of wanting to force their religious beliefs on others. Yet contrary to these trends and suspicions, people of Christian faith in public service have made a difference throughout history. Because we're talking about people of Christian faith, we must naturally start with the Bible. And in the Bible, there are many examples of people of faith making a difference through their vocation of public service. Daniel was a senior advisor to the crazy president of Iraq. Esther was an activist first lady of Iran. Matthew worked for the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> Cornelius was a military officer. And Joseph was prime minister of Egypt. So let's think about Joseph's story for a second. Here we have the Egyptian president who had a premonition of an impending economic catastrophe. 
And yet, when you look around, Egypt was enjoying unparalleled peace and prosperity. None of his cabinet ministers or advisors wanted to risk their lives to make a long-range economic forecast. So they did what was politically expedient. They shifted responsibility to a consultant. <laughs> the head of the president's protective detail recommended that he should look at Joseph. <laughs> Joseph was an administrator who was extremely talented in what he did and a son of an agribusiness tycoon. He was also the victim of human trafficking, an undocumented domestic servant, a former chief of staff to a military commander, a felon convicted of attempted rape, and a deputy prison warden. His checkered past made him the perfect fall guy. <laughs> then Joseph confidently forecasted seven years of record economic prosperity, followed by seven years of a devastating depression. The president of Egypt makes Joseph the prime minister, and his charge was to manage the coming crisis. So Joseph then becomes the greatest commodities future trader of all time. <laughs> he buys and stores enough food to feed Egypt during the famine and to sell to desperate neighboring countries. Finally, Joseph accepts land for food from desperate Egyptian citizens toward the end of this famine, while the citizens accept seed capital from the Egyptian government to rebuild the economy. Literally, it was seed capital, it was seed, kind of gets a joke. <laughs> and in exchange, the Egyptian government gets a guaranteed 20% return on investment. The result was a robust economic recovery from the Great Depression of 1878 BC. The Bible is not the only place that you can find Christians in public service making a difference. Joan of Arc was a teenage war hero. Lord Shaftesbury was world renowned as a godly statesman. William Wilberforce was a British MP responsible for the abolition of slavery throughout most of the British Empire. And then there was my favorite, Elias Boudinot. He was my long ago predecessor at the United States Mint and one of America's founding fathers. Elias was a very successful lawyer known for his brilliant legal mind, his financial prowess, and his management skills. He placed his talents at the service of the young nation. He was a colonel in the Continental Army. He was president of the Second Continental Congress, and he represented the state of New Jersey in the very first US Congress and served three terms before retiring from public office. And then President George Washington appointed him director of the United States Mint. The year was 1795, and the Mint was in crisis. Its production was way too small, its costs were way too high, and it was a horrible place to work. The Mint was failing in its mission to make enough US currency to facilitate commerce, and that failure was putting the nation's fledgling economy into crisis. Elias Boudinot believed in the divinely ordained vocation of public service. He also believed that Christians are called to put things right in this world that God had created. So he served as director of the United States Mint for 10 years. And what was the result? Production dramatically increased, costs went down significantly, and morale and employee retention were greatly improved. A divided Congress was so impressed, they allowed the Mint to become an independent agency reporting directly to George Washington. Elias retired in 1805. He helped avert a national crisis. He left the Mint and the United States of America considerably better off because of his public service. Boudinot spent the rest of his life fighting for the rights of black citizens and, in, and Native Americans. He also helped found the American Bible Society one of the oldest Christian ministries in our nation and responsible for the four Bibles in every household. That was a lot due to the ABS. And he served as its first president 
until his death six years later. Elias was not the first Christian public servant in America, nor was he the last. Today, members of Congress from both houses and from both sides of the aisle meet for regular Bible studies. Faith and Law is a bipartisan Christian fellowship made up of congressional chiefs of staff. During my tenure in two Bush administrations, I helped found the White House Christian Fellowship. That soon expanded to seven different Bible studies within the White House and 40 Bible studies in the cabinet departments. And at the White House, I can personally attest that followers of Jesus Christ served at all levels and with distinction. Several cabinet members as well were faithful Christians. Among them, Steve Preston, who served as 14th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. He played a critical role during the subprime and financial crises. Which brings me back to my story. At a Secretary of Senior Staff meeting less than a month later, the world was on the verge of an abyss. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were placed into receivership. Bank of America was forced to buy Merrill Lynch. Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. AIG got an $85 billion government bailout. Washington Mutual Bank failed. Congress rejected the troubled asset repurchase program, and that caused the Dow to drop 778 points in one day setting a historical record. In the blink of an eye, things went from worse to worst case scenario. And at the table, we debated strategies and tactics, but permeating our discussion was a moral quandary. Should we hold financial institutions accountable for their risky bets, even if we risk the collapse of the financial industry and more broadly, the collapse of the US and global economies? Or should the government bail out undeserving institutions to prevent a global depression? On one hand, the flourishing of billions of people. On the other hand, the risk of creating a moral hazard. At the peak of the financial crisis, the world demanded answers but our government's point person was having a crisis of his own. Hank Paulson was gripped with fear. Right about this time, he called his wife, Wendy, and he said to her, Wendy, you know, I feel that the burden of the world is on me and that I failed, and it's gonna be very bad, and I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, please, Pray for me. She immediately called on one of her favorite Bible verses, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hank immediately felt a sense of peace and renewed confidence. And with his delegated power in the government and out of God's love, and with his sound mind, Hank decided that the greater good was preventing economic failure and global depression. During the financial crisis, I had an extraordinary team at the United States Mint that I was privileged to lead. And during that time, we lowered circulating coin production without having to lay off any staff. We increased gold bullion production by 700% increased silver bullion production by 400%. And we pushed our profits to over a billion dollars during that time. And we improved our rank in the best places to work in government list from 211 out of 217 to number 58. That was the biggest jump in the history of those ratings. So clearly, Christians in public service can make a difference. But what can we do to ensure that they ever get there? So let me suggest two actions. First, Christians who sense God's call to public service should heed that call. When I first became a follower of Jesus Christ, my Christian friends counseled me to go into full-time Christian ministry. And what they meant was the pastorate, missionary work, or religious nonprofit work. 
And then they said, if I turn my back on God's work to go into the secular workplace, then I should avoid business, entertainment, and public service because that would compromise my faith. Imagine the difference that it would make if all Christians believed that without exception that they were called full-time Christian ministry and that ministry included their vocations. This is the only way that we're going to get more Christians in public service. Second, Christians who are not called to public service should encourage and support those who are. When I worked 18-hour days in the White House, staffing up the administration after the contested election, my church's elders were concerned that I wasn't making all the church's regular meetings during the week. (laughs) They thought that my work-life balance was ungodly, so they put me on membership probation. (laughs) That hurt. It still leaves a mark on my soul 15 years later. Imagine the difference that it would make if the church encouraged and supported its members who were called to public service. So let me close by leaving you with one last thought. If there's anyone here still skeptical on whether or not Christians in public service can make a difference, I want you to consider this. Do you think you would have a better experience at the Department of Motor Vehicles if you were served by a joyful employee? (laughs) Or an IRS agent who is treating you with kindness? (laughs) Or if we had a president who is known primarily for their goodness. Joy, kindness, goodness are some of the fruits of the spirit that manifest themselves in mature Christians. So can Christians make a difference in public service? I believe that the answer is a resounding yes. They have in the past, they're currently doing so now, and they will in the future. In fact, I believe that Christians in public service are essential to good government. Thank you.